Hi again. Um, it's me. Um, so in my first video, I introduced myself to you guys and um, told you a little bit about my journey. Um, if you want to watch that, then you can go back and watch all of that. I am not going to do that again in this video. Um, so I am just going to jump right in with my stats. So I had vertical sleeve gastrectomy VSG on January 9th um, at Overlake Hospital in Bellevue, Washington with Dr. Gupta. My highest weight recorded was 301 pounds. My weight on surgery day was 276 pounds. Um, the last time I weighed myself was Sunday. I try to make it a point to weigh myself every week. Um, because, um, as I said in my last video, I, when I first got home from the hospital, I had made it a point to weigh myself every day. And, um, let's just say that wasn't the greatest of my ideas. So, um, I have gone to weighing myself every week. Um, so I did weigh myself on Sunday, which was almost a week ago. So I'm almost due for weigh-in again. So um, instead of a week apart, these videos, I'm going to try to make a video on Sunday. And I'm going to try to consistently make my videos on Sundays. Um, the reason I'm coming to you on a Friday is because I had some good news today. And so I just figured now was as good as time as any to start um so my weight on sunday was 253.9 pounds um that means since surgery i have lost 22.1 pounds um and my total weight loss has was 47.1 sorry if i keep looking this way but i have my kind of notes written down um so yeah, 47.1 pounds in total. Um, I don't know why I thought I would be losing a lot faster than I am. Um, if I had the time in this video, I would actually tell you all the reasons that I'm kind of glad that I'm not losing weight as quickly as I thought I should be. Um, but anybody who has lost weight very rapidly or had the... Um, gast or had bariatric surgery you guys probably already know what I'm about to say and that is um, the main reason I'm kind of glad that I'm not dropping as quickly as I had originally hoped I would is um, loose skin the slower you lose weight the less you risk um, loose skin now I am not naive enough to think that I can avoid it altogether but um, I guess I'm using that as a silver lining to not losing as quickly as people say I should be losing but then again every process is different as well and so I can't really base my progress off of somebody else's so I am just taking it day by day and letting it do what it's gonna do um, so now that I've rambled on enough, I will jump right into what this video is about, my surgery process. So, um, pre-op, I guess that's a good place to start. So, um, I originally started my, <laughs> brace yourselves people. Okay, I originally started my bariatric progress or journey in October of 2017 mind you I am coming to you two months post-op in 2019 yeah so um when I first started it was going like clockwork like it was going super smoothly um and where I hit my first roadblock was when they um, asked me to switch my primary care physician over to a Kaiser Permanente physician. 
which I refuse to do. Nothing against Kaiser primary care physicians, but I had been seeing my primary care physician since I was a young adult. So she has been with me through all of my horrible menstrual cycles, my, you know, um, my health up and downs, my asthma attacks, my, um, anxiety my you know so she kind of knew everything that was going on with me medically and um I thought that that would be a very handy tool after surgery to have somebody who knows my health history so well and going into a major surgery like this I did not want to be starting over with a complete stranger so there was the logic behind that so in that thinking, though, somewhere along the line, um, I became the middleman for all of my medical records. So um, I was having an issue getting paperwork um, transferred between the two, um, you know, weigh-ins and stuff, because there's a certain amount of weight that you have to lose before you can have surgery. Um, for me, it was... I believe like 10% of my excess body weight or something I had to lose before I could have surgery. So my approval process, smooth selling. Um, I went to my primary care physician. She put in a referral for bariatric surgery and um, I wanna say maybe two weeks later, I got the letter in the mail saying that I had been approved for the bariatric program. Um, and so that was about the only thing that went smoothly for me was the acceptance process because everything after that was hoop after hoop after flaming freaking hoop, okay? Um, so first, the paperwork. So you have labs that you have to take. You have um, specialists that you have to see. I was not aware that... Well, this was kind of ignorance on my part, though, so I can't really blame them for this part. My sleep study. I scheduled my sleep study, and I was all set for it. And I show up to my sleep study only to find out that my sleep study is a $500 copay if I do it through Multicare. Um, and there lies my problem. My primary care physician is contracted with Multicare. And so um, usually um, we kind of discuss that my health insurance is through Kaiser. And so any specialist that I need to see would have to be like a Kaiser specialist to avoid all of the out-of-pocket out expenses. Um, but this particular time, we did not have that discussion. Um, and so she automatically referred me to a multi-care sleep study specialist. So um, I ended up having to cancel that appointment um, while I was sitting in the waiting room. So here I am canceling my appointment and having to reschedule with a Kaiser sleep study specialist who happens to be booked out for three months. Fun. So that was three months of my life wasted. Um, and I will get into why I say that in just a second. So um, if that was not enough, so I'm waiting around for three months while um, to get my sleep study. I can't really do anything else. I can't really do my labs and all of that stuff because those can't be more than 30 days old when you have your surgery. So if I had done all my labs and everything, I would have just had to go and do them again because they would have been more than 30 days old. Way, way more. Um, <laughs> about a year more. Um, so... I waited around. I ended up finally having my sleep study done in February of 2018. So at least this finally brings us into 
18. Turns out I do have sleep apnea, and so that's another three months where they had to monitor my sleeping patterns. They sent me home with a CPAP machine. I had to wear the CPAP machine for at least 90 days. They had to record how well I was doing on it, if I was compliant, and then they had to send a compliance letter over to my surgeon's office. And that was a whole ordeal. So that was another three months. Um, I did manage to talk them down to 30 days, though, compliance. Um, and so I was originally supposed to have my surgery back in April of 2018. Well, um, I get a phone call that the person, well, the surgeon that was originally supposed to be performing my surgery left. Just dipped out. Um, of course, they probably had an explanation. I didn't get one. I got the whole personal reasons, um, spill, but I'm not a stupid individual. It was not hard for me to put two and two together. Something went wrong at the office because he took all his nurses with him. And, um, that would be one hell of a coincidence that him and all of his nurses happened to have family emergencies at the same exact time. So him and all of his nurses just took off, which left the surgeon that they were left with, with double the caseload. And so now I'm finding myself having to be fit in wherever I could be fit in at. So, um, that happened. And so just when I'm thinking, okay, so it's not going to be April, it's probably going to be somewhere more along the lines of May, maybe even June, I get hit with another crisis. Um, my blood sugar takes a spike, and I mean, it jumped up to about 426, and then for about two months, I could not get my blood sugars to go under 300. <sighs> um, and it was around this time that my iron also dropped, um, damn near bottomed out. So, um, I went on insulin for a little while to, uh, bring my, to bring my blood sugars down, which worked. Um, and I went back on iron three times a day to bring my iron up which kind of worked. Um, I'm still at the very low end of normal when it comes to iron, but then again, I will always be at the low end of normal when it comes to iron because um, I have the alpha thalassemia trait, which is a hemoglobin, um, I could get into all of this, but um, this video is already 13 minutes long, so um, I won't. It has to do with your hemoglobin production. Um, so, um, the point of all of that is that I will always run low in iron, but um, I was extremely low. And so, um, it did bring me back up to the very low end of normal kind of borderline um normal um and so we had discussed that um if I were to still have bariatric surgery that um we would also have to discuss um the possibility of me having an iron transfusion before the operation um, just to kind of boost my iron so that if it did happen to drop during surgery it wouldn't be life-threatening you know so we talked about that and um, after getting my blood sugars under control and everything and um, being officially diagnosed as diabetic um, it was just a waiting game after that, but 
the obstacles that I was having to go through is when I finally did do my labs and um, like my pre-op exams and all of that. I had to be the one to fax all of my records over to my surgeon's office because there was a disconnect somewhere between my doctor's office and my surgeon's office where they were not getting my medical records to go into my record. Um, so they weren't being able to see my weigh-ins, they weren't being able to see my lab results or any of that. So that's what I meant by earlier when I said I suddenly became the middleman um which i didn't mind i just pretty much ended up doing all of the footwork when it came to my um surgery um which i mean it got frustrating after a while just because i felt like i was going through so much more than everybody else um a friend of mine was going through the process and she was about two weeks ahead of me um, and her process just seemed to be going so smoothly because all of her her primary care physician all of her specialist everything was through Kaiser and so she didn't have to do anything but show up to her appointments and that was it and so I just felt like I was going through so much more than everybody else was going through like their process was just so much more smooth than mine you know um but uh my mom talked me down I love my mom she's a wonderful woman uh my mom she is um she's very knowledgeable and um very wise very very wise and so she kind of talked me off the cliff every time I felt like I was getting a little discouraged or whatever she would talk me down and just let me know that hey yes you're having to do extra work but you know that you're gonna appreciate this process a lot more you are gonna appreciate it because you had to put so much work into it um and you never want to do this again and so you're gonna make sure that you're successful at it the first time because you don't want to do this again and she was damn right (laughs) I don't want to do this again Um, if you asked me today if I would make the decision to have the surgery again absolutely absolutely hands down best decision I ever made for myself if I had known everything that I had to go through and wanted to do it again absolutely not absolutely not if I could go back when they asked me if I wanted to get a PCP through Kaiser um, I might have reconsidered that that is a maybe um, because I still do love my primary care physician and um, but I was not aware that I could have one through Kaiser and keep my primary Um, so I wish they had told me that in the beginning that would have been nice information to have because it could have saved me all of the third party work that I had to do Um, so there was that and then you know the waiting the three months for my sleep study and then the months it took to get my diabetes back under control and so before I knew it um, I was scheduling clear into November of 2018 so my original surgery date was November 19th 2018 I had my bag packed I was ready for it and I get hit with a severe respiratory infection (laughs) two days before mind you my clinic is not open on weekends I get hit with a respiratory infection I wake up on a Saturday morning feeling like my head is going to explode, feeling like my lungs are going to absolutely jump out of my chest. And I have nobody to call. I can't call anybody and tell them, hey, um, mind you, my appointment is scheduled for that next Monday morning at, I'm supposed to be there at about 5.30 in the morning. The office doesn't open until about 8 in the morning. 
So I can't even tell anybody that I'm not going to make it for my surgery. Um, and I think, I swear that nurse jinxed me over the phone the night before the, um, admitting nurse or whatever, who calls you to do the pre-admission and all that. I swear she jinxed me because the last thing she said on the phone was, well, if you're feeling sick or you feel like you're getting a cold or something, please call the office and do not come in. And that was the last thing she said to me before she said goodbye. And then all of a sudden, that next fucking morning, I wake up feeling like I had been hit by a Mack truck. I was so angry. And I was like, man, maybe it's just like a 24-hour bug. Maybe I can wait it out and still be fine by the time I go to have surgery. But I'm like, just in case, I'm going to go ahead and give the um, consulting nurse a call. The 24-hour nurse's line or whatever. Um, and so I call them and I just let them know my situation. And she's like, well, the best I can do is, um, since we can't get in touch with your surgeon right now, because their clinic doesn't open until Monday morning, we can let you speak with the on-call surgeon that we have um, and just, he can just kind of give you his advice on what he would do or what he would tell his patients to do in this situation. And so, um, so he, um, calls me back and he's like, I hear you're not feeling well. Um, well, this is what I would tell my patients to do. Wait until tomorrow. And if you're not feeling better by tomorrow, do not show up for your appointment. And now that you have made a record that you're not feeling well, we will be the one to inform your surgeon that you will not be attending for surgery and that you need to reschedule. Okay. So I'm like, okay, you know what I mean? Sunday comes and goes and I'm feeling even worse. Um, so, um, I get a call Monday morning around eight o'clock and it's the admitting nurse. And she's like, um, you were supposed to be in surgery at six o'clock this morning. We were just wondering what's going on. And I'm like, well, I spoke with the consulting nurse. I even spoke with the on-call surgeon and it should be all in my file that I did speak with somebody and, um, I'm just not feeling very well. Uh, apparently, I have some kind of upper respiratory infection. And, uh, <laughs> quote, unquote, this is what she said to me. Yes, you sound horrible. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Um, so, she's like, I hope you feel better. We can, uh, when you're feeling better, call the office and we can get you all rescheduled and... So I was like, okay. And so I was feeling better. It took about, it took about two weeks. Um, so I called to reschedule um, and they wanted to schedule me on Christmas Eve. And I was like, yeah, no, I want to spend my Christmas Eve with my family. Um, and so, um, instead we chose the beginning of the year. And so that's how we ended up settling upon January 9th. But that brings me to my pre-op experience. Um, I know this was supposed to be my whole experience, but this video is already 24 minutes long. And so I am going to make another video about my actual surgery day. And if that runs too long, then I will have to make another video part four about um, my post-op experience since surgery. So um, if you're looking forward to hearing more about my surgery, then stay tuned. I'll see you later.